Welcome back to another Reddit readings video. If you enjoy these stories, don't be scared to leave a like. Now, to be scared, sit back, relax, and enjoy. My nighttime park stalker. At the time this happened, I was 13F, so this happened two years ago and I was fairly naive. I was a major introvert, only friends with a few people in my class. I wanted to be social but I preferred to be alone and read or write. Classic nerd things. In early November, I got a text on my phone that was from a few classmates whose phone numbers I had and around one or two I couldn't recognize. It was a group chat, asking if we wanted to hang out at night near a park at our school. My parents, being strict and paranoid, would never let me go. Luckily, or what I thought was luck, they were heading out for an overnight trip. They would be back around 4 in the morning. Everything fell into place. Once my parents left around 8ish, I ran out the door and made my way to the park. The one thing I made sure to do was lock the door. My parents were paranoid after all and it was their biggest thing that they engraved into me. Once I arrived at the park, I noticed a creepy figure near the edge of the woods. No one else seemed to notice it, and I already had enough reputation as a weirdo who was true crime obsessed. I didn't mention it. The night drew on and on. I was having the time of my life, ignoring the gut feeling I had telling me to run. Every so often I would look over my shoulder, and the man would still be standing there. Around 9.45, four out of the ten people there had to leave due to their curfew. It was getting cold and was nearly pitch black with a few street lights every so often. The rest of us decided to go as well, since it felt more eerie and quiet. The place we were hanging out at was a field that was fenced in with a few exits and entrances. A large wide field with a small park in the back and our giant middle school behind us. The front of the field faced the empty road and the right and left sides were surrounded by forest. All of the people left were getting picked up by cars meaning that they went the opposite way of the road since that's where the parking lot was. The man stood by the right forest, road exit that I needed to take to get home. I walked away from my group and tried to steady my heavy breathing. I didn't want to be paranoid but all the true crime I listened to was catching up to me. The man was probably early 40s to late 30s, dark hair with a beard. He was probably around 5'9", but at the time it seemed like 6'0". He stood about 10 feet from the exit I had to take so when I got close enough to it, I ran for about 30 feet through the exit and through the woods. Once I felt safe enough I started just to quickly walk through the woods, or at least get to the road. I heard a snap and a crunch from behind me. I stopped walking for a second and quickly checked over my shoulder. Around 15 feet behind me stood the very same man. He was walking slowly behind me, almost as if he was trying not to be suspicious. But it only made my fear worse. I turned around and walked so quickly, I was basically jogging. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park we had hung out at and I wasn't athletic enough to run home. After around 7 minutes of walking fast, I was in my neighborhood. I knew that I could run to my house if I had to, so I checked to see if he was still trailing behind me. To my horror, he was only 5 feet away. I ran. I ran faster than I've ever ran. I could hear his footsteps behind me thumping across the concrete as he ran too. I dove down an alleyway I knew well and tried to lose him in a park, making my way home longer. I could hear his heavy breath followed by his footsteps as he tried to keep up. I cut through houses, backyards and front yards. I finally made it to my house and flew up the steps. I looked behind me and he had just arrived at the bottom of my stairs. I unlocked the door and burst through it, shoving it closed behind me and I heard him hit the door with his whole body. I ran around the house and locked all the windows, turned off the lights and hid in my bedroom with a kitchen knife, just in case he got in. He wasn't lucky. If this was a better world, that's where my story would end. But it doesn't. After a few months, I haven't really told anyone what's happened since I don't want to get in trouble with my parents for sneaking out or anything. I didn't go out with anyone or any group anymore and my loner status returned. I began to write horror stories as a coping mechanism and never went out past seven. It was around February when a classmate of mine was sharing a story of some random man following her home on the bus. She described him almost the exact same as the man who had chased me home. Another girl mentioned that he sounded like the guy who stood outside the school and tried to follow her home. I didn't join in but everyone agreed that he was just a weird guy. He was kind of forgotten and eventually I moved on too. Around me, I was getting ready to walk to school when my mom pulled me aside and showed me a picture of a man. The guy who stalked me actually, she told me that he had been arrested two weeks ago for sexually assaulting a child and had escaped last night. She told me to keep an eye out for him and to call the cops if I saw him. 
I was shaking the whole time I walked to school. It haunts me to know that if he had caught me, I would most likely be in her position or even dead. So, creepy nighttime stalker who liked to hunt down young girls and sexually assault them. Let's not meet again. <gasps> I moved into a house last month and I found a dusty journal under the bedroom carpet. Last month, my wife and I had gotten a home after almost a year of looking and making several offers that we were outbid on. Despite offering well over asking price, seriously, the market is brutal right now. Anyways, we got this house under strange circumstances. First, we actually underbid on it by quite a bit under the asking price, and we've been overbidding and getting outbid, so we were sure we were not getting this. Since even with the underbid, it was right at the edge of our budget, we also requested the seller help with the down payment with 3%. Can't remember the term for that, since some stuff needed to be fixed in the house, and they actually agreed. Then, since we had an FHA loan, we had to have an inspection that needed certain things fixed before we could use it to purchase the house, and they fixed everything on the list within a few days instead of calling it off. I couldn't figure out why they agreed to all of this when it was clearly a seller's market, but we got the house, we moved in, and there were weird noises and the basement reminds me of the end of the Blair Witch Project. But I figured it is an old house, it is bound to have creaky floorboards and the creepy stone wall basement. However, every now and again, things feel weird. I've kept busy on my days off fixing things and updating things around the house. As I said, it is old and needs some work. The task I did the other day was fixing the bedroom carpet. It was laid down and never made tight, so it had big creases sticking up that were mild trip hazards. I got out my tools and peeled back the corner to begin rolling it back up so I can make it tighter, then just trim off the excess after I secure it to the ground again. At least that was what I planned to do. I did not expect to find the beat up, dusty leather journal under the carpet. Of course I read it. I'm mildly creeped out by the contents, which I will share with you here. I mark this as NSFW as the author seems to enjoy swearing at times. April 5th to April 6th, 2020. I've never done a journal before, and my psychiatrist says it would be great for me, as I have been dealing with depression and this whole situation isn't helping. Between the depressing news and not being able to go out and simply do anything to take my mind off of things for a while. Video games and Netflix only help so much, and the drugs they prescribed also only lessen the edge of my constant existential dread. Anyways, what did I do today? Well, I slept most of the day away, as I used to work third shift, so I am basically nocturnal for the most part. I woke up to the wife working at home. She hates being stuck at home all the time too. It is nice we get to see each other a bit more, but there is only so much you can do as far as activities and engaging with one another in an apartment. I cooked some beer braised beef stew in my Dutch oven. Took about three hours and I made wah well, a too much. But hey, meals later in the week, am I right? I played a bit of Resident Evil 3 Seconds Remake. It isn't bad, and Nemesis is as intimidating as I remember him from the PlayStation days for a couple hours afterward while the wife showered and watched some videos on YouTube. She went to bed around 1am, and I stayed up, switching over to Monster Hunter for a few hours. It is about 5am on the 6th, and I'm getting tired. I have got to go and run errands tomorrow, as the laundry needs done, and the groceries need replenished. I think this is what my doctor wants to see on my next visit, whenever that happens to be. So peace out. April 6 to 7, 2020. So, I started out my day at about 2 in the afternoon. Woke up and greeted my wife, grabbed some breakfast, just a simple bowl of cereal, and used the last of the milk. No biggie, as I was going to go shopping in a couple hours. I washed the dishes and grabbed the baskets of laundry. Kissed my wife before leaving. I noticed she was watching the news. Something seemed odd about the news report, but I figured it was my still waking up mind just letting my imagination go a bit. I shrugged and headed out. On the back porch by where we park our cars, I saw the little stray cat me and the wife feed. We named him Pipsqueak. Pip for short, because he was tiny when he first started visiting and he doesn't really meow. He squeaks. He was begging for food, like usual with his squeaks. So I popped back in and grabbed a can of the puree we got for him and put it in his bowl. Our neighbor was on the front porch and we exchanged greetings as I got into my car to head to my first stop. The laundromat. It was pretty empty, despite being in the center square of town. Then again, not many people are out and about these days. I was thrilled the big washers were open and tossed our laundry in them along with some Tide Pods and read the last wish from the Witcher series as I waited for the washers to finish, then tossed the laundry into the dryer. 
and continued reading, folded it all up to the best of my ability. I'll admit here that I am nowhere near as good as my wife in this regard. I stopped by the apartment to drop off the laundry to make room for groceries. My wife was in the bathroom, so I told her I was heading to the grocery store and if she needed anything to text me or call while I'm out. Told her I loved her and noticed the news was still on the TV. It was the same anchors on. Despite me being down at the laundromat for nearly an hour and a half, I thought it was strange as most news was half hour to an hour long. But I shrugged and headed out. The grocery store had more people in it, a few were wearing masks. It wasn't required yet in our state, but I figured it would happen soon. I got the things we needed replenished on, and a few things to make dinner on the grill. I love grilling, especially charcoal. I feel every man should know how to grill, it is good for the soul. I got home, and the wife was playing some internet game. She helped me put away the groceries and I prepared some kebabs and headed out to fire up the grill with all the supplies in hand and noticed the same anchors on the news again. I hadn't paid attention to what they were saying all day, but figured they were just rerunning the same stuff from earlier, like highlights, and I just happened to walk by each time by sheer coincidence. I grilled up a delicious dinner, and we ate, then sat back and did some planning for a party we are having in a few months, and discussed what we needed for around the house. Once again, she went to bed before me and I played a few hours of a game to wind down. I'm writing this at about 4.30 in the morning, and I'm heading to bed. April 7th to April 8th, 2020. I got woken up by sirens and loud banging and footsteps in the neighbor's overhead apartment, roughly 12.30, when this all happened, so I was a little groggy. I asked the wife if she knew anything, and she didn't know. I put on my pants and an old t-shirt and headed out to speak with one of the police outside. Long story short, a neighbor died at some point between yesterday and today. It is strange, because I had just exchanged pleasantries with him yesterday, and he looked fine. Besides being somewhat old, I told the officers as much. Some paramedics in biohazard suits brought out a stretcher with a body bag on it, and there was a crying lady in what I think would be about the age to be his daughter, roughly in her 40 seconds. I guess she stopped in and found him dead, so that was a bit of a shock. I went back in and told the wife, the news was on again, and it was the same channel as yesterday, same anchors, and this time I noticed they were only talking about coronavirus death. I'm kinda getting tired of hearing about it. Somehow this damn virus has invaded every aspect of our lives, like a relative that drops in and just won't leave. Anyways, my wife took it mostly in stride. We played some cards against humanity and heated up some of the stew around dinner time. I turned on the TV, and they were rerunning that crap about the virus again, so I changed the channel. Same anchors, same story. I was puzzled for a second, then clicked again, and got Travel Channel, just in time for Ghost Adventures. I honestly think they fake a lot of their evidence, but I watch it just for their overreactions to absolutely everything. I decided to hit the hay at the same time as the wife tonight, writing this out as she takes her turn to prepare for bed in the bathroom and it looks like I timed this just right. April the 14th of April 15th. Sorry, I missed a few days. Been doing pretty much the same things as I have been doing since this all started. Mostly household chores and a few errands here and there as needed since we are under lockdown, which is seriously dragging on me and the wife. I hope this ends soon. The greatest tragedy is all the Chinese restaurants I have tried to go to are all closed. I am craving some lo mein and some egg rolls. I can really use a MSG fix. I miss Chinese food. I hope this insanity ends soon so I can have some delicious teriyaki chicken. Anyways, today, the cop stopped by and asked me a bunch of questions about the neighbor. Mostly basic stuff. I never really knew much about him other than he lived upstairs. Seemed friendly enough and drank a ton of Budweiser, judging from the cans in the recycling bin every week. They also asked if I was alright, as it turns out he died of the virus. The cops were a little off. They smelled a bit like burnt plastic and didn't seem entirely normal in their behavior. It is hard to explain, but their speech patterns were off somehow, and their body language didn't seem entirely normal. I could just be letting my boredom get the best of me though, and letting the imagination run with stuff that isn't entirely there. I want to tell myself that, but I swear as they walked back to their cruiser in their slightly not right walk, I saw one of them grab their radio and I swear I heard them say subject 2314 degrees celsius still responding. Increase exposure. I want to believe I was just hearing things, and I want to believe it wasn't about me. But it seemed really strange. An increase exposure of what? I don't notice anything different to the start of this mess, so I can just be getting paranoid. 
Anyways, after pondering that, I did a supply run to the local store. I got lucky and got the last bulk package of toilet paper. That is one thing I will never understand. The sudden hoarding of toilet paper. It is a respiratory illness. It isn't likely to give you the screaming squirt. I can understand the cleaning supplies being pretty much ransacked though. Also, eggs are ridiculously priced. One dozen for $3.69. That is insane. I got some for my wife anyways, as she loves eggs, but still, got home and the news was on again, and on more channels, still talking about coronavirus death. I have noticed they never seem to change their clothes, must be a set they wear just for filming or something. Like how some TV characters are always in the same clothes it seems. I didn't pay much attention. Me and my wife played a rousing game of Monopoly, Cthulhu Edition, where I lost because she had all the railroads and the dice decided I should keep hitting them. We then watched some of an anime I have on DVD that she had never seen, and went to bed. I forgot to write this initially, then I woke up and realized my wife wasn't in bed with me, so I went to check up on her. She said she just isn't tired yet and I should get to sleep. I'm concerned, so I am waiting up a bit longer for her and writing this out as I lay in bed waiting on her. April 17th to 18th, 2020. Yeah, I know I missed another day. I'm losing track of time since every day is pretty much the same routine almost with slight variations. However, a couple of weird things happened today. I woke up around noon, grabbed a bite to eat, and got ready to head out, as I had to get groceries. It rained last night, and pretty much everything was wet outside, except the bit of the porch close to the wall, as it is under a patio. Pip was there for food, so I ducked back inside and got him a can of food and gave him a few pets on the back. That is when I noticed, right outside the bedroom window, the bedroom is right on the other side of the wall from the porch, a set of wet footprints, barefoot, and oddly shaped. My wife has small feet, and mine are a bit on the wide side, so it wasn't any of ours. I was a bit baffled. I double-checked the window. It was still locked and had no signs of tampering, but still. I headed to the store and even more people were wearing masks. I tried to keep out of the six-foot range from everyone, so I didn't have any problems with anyone. I already don't like people, but lately, they have been a whole new level of asinine letting their fears get the better of them. Anyways, I got some basics and some ice cream, since my wife wanted some. The weird part is when I got home, I swear I saw someone looking at me from my neighbor's window as I pulled in. I called the landlord, wondering if he had been up there, but got no answer, so I called the cops. Despite my uncertainty about my last encounter with them in regards to my neighbor, I just assumed I was just overthinking things and called them. They got here in just a couple minutes. They still seemed unnatural, in that slightly off way I mentioned earlier. I still cannot put my finger on it. They checked the apartment and found nobody. They told me to let them know if I see anyone again. I told them I would. I doubt I will. They are unsettling. Their presence makes my hairs all stand up, and I actually have no problem with the police. But these two officers, I cannot figure it out. It also doesn't help that I swear I heard the one radio in subject 2314 degrees Celsius still responding. Increase exposure, as they were getting into their cruiser again. I could dismiss it once, but hearing the same thing twice is a little unnerving. I tore the apartment apart trying to find anything that could be out of place after that. I also checked out the vents and heaters and even the water, and it all looks normal, tastes normal. I could just be letting my relative isolation be getting to me. But damn, I hope this all ends soon. Late in the afternoon, I went out to get the mail and noticed a package from Amazon for my wife. It was heavy, like a book. I'm still a bit concerned for her. She hasn't been sleeping much the past few days. I gave her the package hoping its contents would improve her mood. I left her to it and went outside to fire up the charcoal grill to make some burgers for dinner. I gave her a dose of that sleep aid medicine and why Quill came out with around 10 p.m. to help her get a few hours of sleep. I had gotten it at the store to help her. I honestly think it is the stress of the whole situation getting to her. I hoped she would sleep through the night. I woke up at about 3 a.m. to thudding sounds coming from the dead neighbor's apartment directly over our bedroom. I rolled over to ask my wife if she heard it too. She was not there. I guess the sleep medicine failed. I crawled out of bed to go check on her and maybe use the restroom while I was at it. I found her, looking so very tired, at her desk in the office, with the Amazon box open. It was full of New Age spell books and she was feverishly paging through one of them. I asked if she was okay, and I clearly startled her. She insists she has it under control. I doubt it, but I left her to her devices. She can be rather stubborn at times. 
Hopefully she gets better. If not, I do not know. I hope it doesn't come to that bridge. I decided to head outside quickly to grab my charge cable from my car. As I noticed my phone was close to dead, I couldn't help but glance at the windows upstairs since I heard thumping up there earlier. And son of a bitch, there was someone watching me. It was my dead neighbor. I froze dead in my tracks and stared him straight in the eyes for what seemed like forever. He didn't move or even seem to breathe. He just stared straight at me. I managed to regain my composure and I bolted inside the apartment and pushed a chair in front of the door under the knock. I was sweating and out of breath and shaking. I finally managed to calm down enough to write this. I'm going to try and get more sleep. April 18th to 19th, 2020. What the hell? I tried watching some TV after last night to see if there was any news on and see if there was anything about when the quarantines would end. I made a baffling discovery. The same news anchors from before are on in the same clothes and talking about coronavirus death. Here are the kickers. It is on every goddamn channel. I don't understand. Are they having difficulties at Comcast? I tried calling them, but I'm not getting any answers and the machine tells me to call back later. That does make me think they are booked with similar calls. So everybody is calling to complain. I also noticed it is a loop of the same report playing over and over again. They must have some serious signal issues or something. I hope that is what it is. My wife is looking rough from several days of little sleep. I had to venture out and try and find masks for us to wear. Since tomorrow, it is going to be mandatory to pretty much go anywhere. I asked if she needed anything when I was out, and she told me that she ordered what she needed, so I should just focus on masks. I asked if she wanted to come with me, but he declined. She decided to pour over those times instead. I had seen Pip before I went out the door today and took a can with me to feed him. I stopped short however, because it was completely dry out today, and it only took maybe 20 seconds to get the can of cat food, and there were now two sets of wet bear footprints outside the bedroom window. They were different sizes, and there were no other prints on the porch leading up to the window. Pip seemed to be staring at something. I hopped off the porch, giving the prince a wide berth and gave the cat his food, then got out of there thoroughly weirded out. I really hope it was a kid trying to be funny. Of course, nowhere had any masks or any sort of face covering. I ordered some online and grumbled at the fact it would be a few weeks until arrival. For all I knew, this could all be over by then. I decided to grab a few things at the store we were short on to look like I hadn't completely failed in my outing when I got home. Inside the little grocery store almost everyone had masks on despite the mandatory wearing of them starting tomorrow. I accidentally got within six feet of someone and they just screamed at me. It wasn't normal. It was primal and loud, like a gorilla getting ready to tear something apart. Except this came from a 90-something pound lady. Needless to say, it caught me off guard and I jumped and nearly crapped myself. After the initial surprise got to me, I apologized, but she kept going. Nobody wearing masks reacted at all, but anyone not wearing one all looked wondering what was going on. I just decided to back up as she was getting hoarse at this point, and the second I got more than six feet away from her, she stopped and carried on like nothing happened. Me and a few people who were not wearing masks looked at each other like WTF was that. I just simply shrugged and went to grab my gallon of milk from the cooler when I heard another scream from down the aisle. One of the other non-mask wearing guys got too close to an elderly man this time. It was very strange as pretty much the same thing happened. I decided to get the hell out of there then and there, got in the only unoccupied line and got out of there. When I got home, I felt something was off. I looked up in the upstairs apartment windows and there was my dead neighbor again. After the grocery store and the prints on the porch, I was done for the day and just gave that bastard the finger and grabbed my shit and went, put the stuff away and retreated to my bedroom for a while. I didn't even look to see if there were any prints on the porch still. I was just done caring. After a while, I came out to use the restroom and to get a drink and to check up on my wife, who was paging through those books still, and now she was taking notes. I asked if I could get anything for her, and she turned me away. I told her she should eat something and that I'd make some dinner, so I got to work on dinner. I took her some and she barely ate. I am really starting to worry. I would like to take her to a doctor to get checked but I'm sure the doctor's offices are booked solid for a while. I tried talking with her, and she seemed annoyed that I'd bother her, though she was trying to humor me for the first half hour. Eventually, I took the hint and gave up. I turned on the TV, and it was still those same damn anchors in the same damn clothes repeating the same few minutes of dialogue about coronavirus death. On every freaking channel still, I gave up, read a bit of a book I've been laying around, and now I'm writing this before I go to bed. It has to end soon. 
April 19th to 20th, 2020. They are making us mandatorily wear masks on top of all the other crap we have to put up with. Of course, I had no luck finding any still, so I am wearing a bandana like I'm some sort of train robber everywhere I go. People still scream if you get within six feet of them, and I still see the neighbor watching me from his window when I exit the house. I still give him the finger to see if I can get a reaction out of him. Nothing. I might try mooting him next time. Not like anyone is going to see me do it. Barely anyone ventures outside. And when they do, it is for basic needs or work. The damn footprints keep multiplying on the porch. Those kids are damn dedicated to a bad prank. Pip now absolutely refuses to come up on the porch, as now the footprints now cover almost the whole all in the direction of the bedroom window. I gotta say, these kids are really dedicated to their shitty prank. If I ever catch them, I have tried calling Comcast several times in the past few days about the glitch with the constant replaying of the same news broadcast on every goddamn channel, and every time, they deny there being any issue. I swear these people are gaslighting me. If they don't fix the issue soon, I'm looking into getting a satellite dish. I've had about enough of this crap. At least I have Hulu, Prime Video, and Netflix until I can figure out how to get a dish installed. I have been dosing my wife with sleep aids still, as she can't seem to stay asleep for more than a few hours at a time even with them. Last night, I caught her in her office with candles and a circle of salt on the ground chanting. I didn't disturb her as I was thoroughly weirded out. I'm going to have to address it with her soon. I'm not looking forward to that one. The police stopped by again today, checking up on us and asking the same questions about our neighbor. They also reminded us we need masks to go anywhere now. They still smell strange and still seem off. I'm getting used to it at this point, and I don't like that I am, especially since I heard one of them radio and once again subject 2314 degrees Celsius still responding. Increase exposure. As he was getting into his car, I tried calling out to them to get an explanation, but they slammed their doors and pulled out like they had some place to be. I'm not sure if they are screwing with me or what, but I am definitely hearing it, as I hear the same exact thing each time. I got contacted by an old friend of mine, Sam. He said I need to download Zoom and get in on some meetings to talk to other people. I might take him up on the offer, but I really didn't like those sort of video call programs. Maybe I can get my wife to hit up some of her friends. I think it would do her some good to have some sort of interaction with others besides just me. Maybe it will do something for her sleep issues and her depression from being stuck inside all the time. Anyways, I'm gonna have to get my prescription filled tomorrow, so I should head to bed. I really don't want to deal with screaming people again. April 20th to 21st, 2020. I caught my wife chanting and seemingly trying to perform witchcraft this morning. I confronted her this time, and she told me she was trying to keep us safe with her spells, and that she spent several days researching how to do them just right. My concern grew exponentially at this. I might have to look online or call a doctor for advice on this. I took her with me to the store to get my prescription. She was resistant to this idea at first, but relented. She did not seem to notice the ever-growing number of wet bear footprints on the porch all facing the window, or Jack staring down at us from above as he always does in his ceaseless gaze. I got her into the car and quickly flipped my dead neighbor the bird, as has become a ritual to me at this point. I had called ahead so my prescription could be filled at the pharmacy by the time we got there. It was a relatively short line, and there were not many people out today. I asked my wife if there was anything in particular she wanted me to cook for dinner. As I could grab the ingredients while we were here, she settled on tacos, which is great because we have most of the stuff at home already, and they are delicious and easy to make. As we were looking for tortillas of the size we wanted, I noticed the people in the store with us were a little off. They seemed like they were in a trance, their eyes were staring into wherever, and looked almost mannequin-like, cold and empty. However, my wife wandered within six feet of one lady, and the lady let out this hellish, banshee-like wail. My wife and I jumped in the sudden frightfulness of it. My wife couldn't move, as she was so scared. The woman wailed herself hoarse, and I could see flecks of blood soaking through her mask. As she continued, I grabbed my wife's hand and pulled her out of the aisle. As soon as we were out of the six-foot radius, the woman went back to being practically lifeless as if nothing had happened. My wife had been freaking out at this point. Her social anxiety was getting the best of her. I gave her the keys and told her to wait in the car, and I'll finish getting dinner. I went out to the car, and she was doing a bit better. I snagged us both sodas at the checkout counter and handed her one, and popped open the other, and opened my prescription to take my daily medication. The pills were different. The bottle was labeled what I got, 
but the pills are completely different than they always looked. My pills were tiny red pills normally, these things were huge and green. I checked the markings on the pill online, and they said they were the same medication, so I took one and I am waiting to see if it affects me in any adverse way. We got home and I set her up with some of her friends on Zoom to talk. I didn't even look up at the neighbor's window as I brought in the groceries, but I was sure he was still there ever watching me. Stubborn, dead bastard, just accept it already. I also noticed there were still more footprints on the porch, and still no sign of Pip. I checked his usual hangouts near the house, and he was nowhere to be found. I hope a big bird didn't decide to eat him. I made dinner and smiled as my wife was sounding better than she had in a while, as she was discussing things with some old friends via Zoom. As we ate, I watched and noticed something odd. Some of her friends kept scratching at themselves, like they had an itch. Over the course of the few hours she was talking to them, it went from light scratches like an itch occasionally, to constant clawing at their flesh, like there was something under the skin. Nobody else reacted to this at all, not even acknowledged, even the ones clawing away. I'm wondering what is under their flesh to cause them to claw like that. After that, my wife and I decided to watch Letterkenny on Hulu, since she loved that show. We hit a snag, and I'm both irked and a bit freaked out by this. Every episode of every show and every single movie was replaced by the damn news story that has been playing for who knows how long now. I checked Netflix and Prime Video, which are showing the same results. What the hell is going on? I decided to put in a DVD, and we watched that, trying to hide my panic for my wife's sake. I gave her some sleep aid and she went to bed. I am writing this and will soon follow. Hopefully getting out and interacting with others helped her a bit. April 21st to 22nd, 2020. Woke up to my wife chanting and trying to cast spells again this morning. I guess yesterday had no real positive effect on her. I just let it go for the time being and tried to get a hold of the doctor. Line was busy. I figured as much. Since everyone and their uncle are panicking over this damn disease, I tried looking online. Half of the web pages I come across are giving me 404 errors. The other half are telling me to seek a medical professional or psychiatrist. I tried calling both at multiple offices in the area in our insurance network. All busy. Ugh. I just need a small win. Why can't I get a small win? I talked to her and convinced her we were well protected right now and she should try and get more sleep. I gave her some more sleep aid to get her to take a few more hours of much needed rest. While she was in bed, I drove to the local doctor's office after getting the address and put it on my navigation app. There was a massive line around the building of people looking like they did yesterday, except they looked more lifeless, more fake. They all stood what looked to be exactly six feet apart. I was creeped out, but rolled down my car window enough to ask if they knew when the doctor would be available. They didn't even acknowledge me, like they really were a bunch of mannequins standing there. I couldn't even recognize any of them. Many looked almost the same with the exception of clothing. Failing to get a doctor, I decided to head home before my wife woke back up. The neighbor was still staring down at me. I figured what the hell, and looked around. There was nobody around. I dropped my pants and mooned him while giving him the finger between my legs. Not very adult, but he still didn't react at all. I hiked up my pants and spat on the porch full of the ever-growing number of footprints outside the window. I was beginning to doubt it was a prank by some local kids. I've never taken a prank this far for so long. Then again, I've never had this much free time. I had trouble getting my bandana off. It felt like it was glued to my face, but after a bit of tugging and some pulled out beard hairs, I got it off. I wonder if I got anything sticky on it and hadn't noticed. It went into the dirty laundry basket and I fished another out of my sock drawer. I prepared some grilled cheese with cream of tomato soup for lunch. Since it is yummy, quick, and easy, I made extra in case my wife woke up from the smell wafting through the apartment. I got a bowl of soup and a sandwich and sat down at the dinner table, mouth watering in anticipation of the meal to come. I cut my sandwich in half and dipped a corner in the soup and bit down. Nothing. I could feel the warmth of the soup and the textures, but there was no flavor. No tomato, no basil, no butter or cheese. Nothing. I spat that mouthful out, thinking it had gone bad and double checked the dates on all the packaging. It was all well within expiration. I sniffed carefully at the soup and sandwich. Nothing smelled off about them. I shrugged and dipped again. And nothing. I spat it out and went to the fridge and tried a pickle out of a jar. Nothing. I tried the black iced coffee. Nothing. Out of desperation, I went to the cabinet and got out the reaper pepper powder and stuck a teaspoon in it and then stuck the teaspoon in my mouth, expecting to suffer in pain. 
but there was nothing. I had lost my ability to taste it would seem. My wife came into the kitchen and saw I had made an extra grilled cheese and had some soup left and helped herself, thanking me for making lunch. She looked a little better from her few hours of napping. I kept the lack of taste to myself for the time being. As I went to my laptop and tried finding anything to what losing my taste might be, I got nothing but 404 errors or gibberish. Hopefully it is something I can sleep off, since it would seem I cannot see a doctor anytime soon by the looks of it. I couldn't taste any of dinner either, and I intentionally overspiced my portion to try and get any stimulation out of my tongue. I'm seriously worried about this. Hopefully I can get a hold of the doctor tomorrow. I drugged my wife again to get her to sleep as she still had serious bags and discoloration under her eyes from lack of sleep. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I can't get a hold of any doctors whatsoever. I'm running out of options quickly and growing desperate to help her. I decided to watch a movie as I typed this out to also help me ease my mind for bed. I have a glass of plantation five-year rum on the rocks I'm sipping on and tasting nothing still as I type. You have got to be fucking kidding me. I tried watching the Boondock Saints for the hundredth or so time, and all the disc has on it is that goddamn news report, over and over again. The trailers and DVD specials are also just that report. It isn't just that disc either. I tried about 20 more DVDs at random, and even some Blu-ray discs, and they all have that damn report on it. How the fucking hell is this possible? I'm losing my shit. I'm trying to be strong for my wife's sake. But holy fucking hell, stuff is beginning to be far more than I can handle. What the hell is going on? I'm going to doze myself to sleep tonight, and then I'm going to hope like hell this is just a bad dream, or that stuff will be better tomorrow or whatever. I need some sort of win. Holy shit, do I need a win of some sort? April 27th to 28th, 2020. I have had a terrible last few days. I have not written in here, as I have been forcing myself to sleep with copious amounts of alcohol and sleep medicine, so I am falling asleep well before I can finish an entry. This is probably going to be my last entry. I have been experiencing the same strange phenomena I have been since this has begun. Something is far from all right in my small community. I don't know if it is the result of an experiment gone wrong. Even worse, an experiment gone right. Or if this is happening everywhere, I just hope someone finds this journal and heed the warning it holds. Something very unnatural has happened here. My neighbor still watches from the window. I don't even bother flipping him the bird anymore. My lack of taste has escalated to my tongue falling out the other day. And as of today, my mask will not come off my face. I'm probably going to starve to death. I tried everything I could think of to get it off, but it is literally fused to my skin somehow. Before I realized this, I tried ripping at it with pliers, using rubbing alcohol to dissolve any glue, using stronger solvents, resulting in chemical burns, and even trying to hit it with the kitchen torch. But the fabric does not relent. I have stopped drugging my wife to sleep. It has lost all effect on her as of two nights ago. She hasn't slept since and she just keeps trying to cast spells in the office. I have failed her. I tried contacting the doctors any way possible. Still nothing. The people in the streets look to be fake and plastic. However, if you still get within six feet of them, they will scream themselves raw in the throat. That motherfucking news story has invaded not only my video game discs now, but also my books, which have transcripts of the damn thing in. It has even invaded my dreams, which is part of why I've been getting blackout drunk. The cops stopped by just a minute ago and I noticed they still smelled of burned plastic far stronger than normal, and they seemed fake all around. I didn't say anything to them. It wouldn't make a difference. I just zoned out, waiting for them to leave. I overheard them say subject 2314 degrees Celsius no longer responds. Move to next phase, I didn't even care anymore. I'm not going to be here much longer. The footprints outside the bedroom window are so numerous, they cover the whole porch and go well out into the yard, where they show up as grass smashed down in the shape of feet all aimed directly at the window, like they want me to open it. I'm at the end of my rope and have no idea what to do as of this point. I am way in over my head, and the situation keeps deteriorating. I hope whoever is responsible for this gets what is coming to them. I'm going to open the window. I feel a calling to do it. It has been there and it is overwhelmingly strong now. If anyone finds my wife, and if she is still with us, please take care of her. I'm going to go see what the things outside my window have to say. So, yeah, no clue what to make of this. I had looked up the records of how often the house had been bought and sold, as they were included in my paperwork when I got the house, and nobody has had it for more than a couple of months for a couple years now. 
Now that you read that, I mention things being weird at times. I feel like I am being watched in my backyard and there is a shadow in the neighbor's window when I look around. Also, I occasionally spot footprints on my back patio facing the bedroom window, but that's just a creepy coincidence, right? It has to be the neighbors screwing with me as a joke from the previous owners, right? The constant changing of hands just has to be from people having a hard time with the economy in the past few years, I hope. <laughs> we went urban exploring in a haunted mental hospital. Some ghosts can hurt you. St. Daniel's Mental Hospital was haunted. Everybody in town knew that, especially Century Manor, the old house at the back of the property which had stood there for 150 years, longer than any other building on the grounds. Maybe that's why it was such a popular place for kids to go urban exploring. We all wanted to prove that we could brave going in there, not just to ourselves, but to each other. That's why Teddy and I went in there, I guess. It was partly just boredom, the product of a late August day with the end of summer vacation looming ahead in the next two weeks. There was a feeling between the two of us left unspoken that we had wasted the summer. Everyone else in class would be talking about trips to Europe or cruises in the Caribbean, while Teddy and I would be left without a story to tell between the two of us. My parents were supposed to take me to the beach one week in July, but it had been thundershowering so we had stayed home. Our camping trip had likewise been canceled due to a family illness. Teddy's family had even fewer planned summer events, but they had been likewise plagued by misfortune and last minute cancellations. His parents' motto seemed to be the same as mine. We'll make it up to you next summer, and that left us feeling antsy and annoyed as we meandered around the perimeter of the mental hospital grounds, the place we were not supposed to venture into. Our families lived in the neighborhood across the street from the century and a half old asylum, so we knew about the lore of the facility better than anyone, but our parents were much more concerned by the tangible threats posed by patients who wandered the hospital grounds largely unsupervised. I know what we should do today, Teddy said suddenly. Let's go explore Century Manor. I heard there's a way to get inside. Part of me wanted to say no, to make up some excuse, but another part of me was desperate for adventure and a tale to tell in September. Everyone else in class would have a vacation story, but we would have a ghost story. All right, let's do it. I agreed, following him as he stepped foot onto the forbidden grounds of the asylum. I hurried after him and we stayed close to the tree line, hoping to avoid detection. When we got to Century Manor, I looked up to see the old building's windows staring down at us like sleepy eyes. Its dark, ancient exterior was falling apart in places, the trim moldy and rotting. Tiles from the roof had slipped off and lay on the grass, turning it brown beneath their weight. So, how are we supposed to get in? I asked, looking at the steel bars on all the windows. How about the front door? Teddy said, smiling, walking towards the entrance. I couldn't believe it. The old wooden door should have been tightly locked but instead it was hanging open, swaying gently in the breeze. Weird, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be locked, I said, following Teddy towards the entrance. It was dark inside, almost impossible to see past the first few feet. My friend took a few tentative steps into the house before being swallowed up by shadows. Hey, wait up, I called after him, but there was no indication he'd heard me. Looking down, I saw a loose brick lying on the porch of the old house. I picked it up and used it as a doorstop, hoping it would prevent anyone from closing the door and sealing us inside. Suddenly I was beginning to realize that was a real possibility. Teddy, I'm not sure about this, I said, stepping into the dark house. It took my eyes a few seconds to adjust. I blinked and looked around to see the old house was dingy and falling apart inside, even worse than the exterior. The ceiling to my right was bulging and looked ready to cave in at any second. The floors creaked noisily with each step I took, as if ready to break. Let's go look upstairs, Teddy said, seeming bored already with the main level. Despite his eager attitude, I felt like there was something immediately wrong with this place. It was like a weight on my soul, crushing my heart and making it difficult to breathe. Don't you feel that? I asked. Feel what? But before I could answer, Teddy was already climbing the stairs going up to the second level. The stairs squeaked and strained with each step. I saw a mouse scurrying up ahead on the main level and hurried to catch up with him, taking a nervous glance back over my shoulder at the front door which was still hanging open, like the door to a trap, about to snap shut. The two of us climbed the stairs and explored the second floor, but of course Teddy wanted to keep going. There was a third floor in the old manor and he wanted to see that too. So far there was nothing to explain the uneasy feeling I was getting. 
but the sensation was growing stronger the closer we got to that third level. I don't like this, I told Teddy as we came to an old, gray wooden door covered in graffiti, including a few pentagrams. Let's go back, okay, this doesn't feel right. He looked at me like I was being a scared little kid, ruining his adventure, which I guessed I was. I felt a little bad about it, but I couldn't ignore the feeling I was getting. It was becoming overwhelming. Okay, you big baby, this is the last room, then we'll leave. He said, pushing the door open as I told him to stop. I had a strong suspicion that whatever was giving me these negative feelings was just beyond that door. And when it opened I saw I was not wrong. The scene playing out on the third floor was like something out of a horror movie, except this was real life. A girl who was dressed in century-old clothing stood before a small fire which was burning at the center of the room. She was giggling as the pile of kindling she had lit grew brighter and the fire burned hotter. I heard her chanting some dark incantation under her breath and her eyes rolled back. Suddenly her voice was no longer that of a child, but of something else much deeper, much more evil. What the hell? Teddy yelled, snapping me out of my terror momentarily. At least he could see it too. If not for that I wasn't sure what I would do. Would you let go of my arm, man? What is your problem? That was when I realized he couldn't see any of it after all. The little girl and the fire, it was all invisible to him. I'd heard this place was haunted, but maybe not everyone was capable of seeing the phantoms who resided here. Just as I had that thought, Teddy pulled his arm out of my vice-like grip and began to march into the room. You're so weird, dude. There's nothing here. I was frozen in place, unable to scream, as he walked straight towards the fire burning in the center of the room. The little girl was now levitating a few inches off the ground, her eyes still white and rolled back. But now she had a mad grin spreading wide across her face. She began to laugh as Teddy strode into the fire. It took him a few seconds to realize what was happening. Like someone who has set their hand on a stove burner, only to realize it is turned on. But then in an instant he was lit up like a torch. Teddy turned into a blazing inferno as the little girl's laugh turned into a screeching cackle. I felt something cold rush through me a second later and then saw two women in white and black habits, like those worn by nuns. They were putting out the fire and praying, holding a Bible up into the air and pulling the little girl back down. She settled gently to the floor as the fire went out and I realized Teddy had also been extinguished as if the fire existed in some other time and I was the only one who could see it and them. Running out of that room, I raced down the stairs to find a security guard at the door, pulling the brick doorstop out of its place. Who keeps opening this door? He was saying to himself. I yelled at him to stop and told him to get help. My friend was in trouble. Not again, the security guard muttered, probably thinking I couldn't hear him. They really need to tear this old place down before it kills anyone else. Luckily Teddy survived the event, but he's been in a coma for quite a while and was unable to defend me during the court proceedings. I was forced to tell the judge what had happened by myself, and he wasn't inclined to believe me. Pyromaniac ghosts aren't exactly the best legal defense, as my exasperated lawyer will tell you. But I wasn't going to lie, and I wasn't going to admit to something I didn't do. I didn't hurt my friend. I didn't leave him there to die. I just hope Teddy wakes up one day soon. I know he'll tell them I'm innocent. Someone smuggled in a cell phone for me so that I could share my story. A true friend. I just hope Teddy can clear my name or I'm gonna be in this asylum for a long, long time. Whatever is living inside my mom's creepy statue, I don't think it's the Virgin Mary. Has anyone heard of a Red Maria? You've probably seen them everywhere. Those cheap ceramic statues of the Virgin Mary, a common fixture of gardens, grottos, and grandmother's houses. In the ordinary version, the safe version, Mary's skin is peach colored, her hair is brown or black, face is plain and unadorned, and her robes are blue. There are, of course, other versions, like the Red Maria. A Red Maria skin is white as snow, but its hair, robes, and lips are crimson. I saw one for the first time when I was eight years old. It had been set up in the alcove at the end of the narrow hallway that led to our three closet-sized bedrooms, one for my mother, one for my sisters Veronica and Esmeralda, and one for me. My mother told me that the Red Maria was there to protect us, but that pale statue didn't make me feel safe. It made me feel, watched, its black painted eyes seemed to follow me, and the nightlight my mother placed beneath the Red Maria only made it worse, that from below, the statue cast eerie shadows on the wall behind. When I crept out of my room to pour water down my parched throat or use the toilet, I tried not to look at it, but my eyes were always dragged, almost unwillingly, to the alcove at the end of the hall. 
I was terrified of what I might see because the Red Maria looked different at night. My sisters said it was just a trick of the light. They said I was acting like a little baby, but they didn't see what I saw. Their room was closer to the bathroom, at the end of the hall. They didn't see the way the Red Maria's jaw seemed to distend, transforming her mouth into a screaming black pit. They didn't see the twisted shadow that rose above the innocuous ceramic statue at the end of the hall. Peering around the corner of my bedroom door, I couldn't help but wonder, what if those freakishly long fingers were caused by more than just the nightlight's glow? What if I looked down the hallway one night and found the alcove was empty? Would I then turn around and see the real Red Maria, a monstrous robed woman, far too tall for my tiny bedroom, glaring down at me with a garish crimson smile? My mother reassured me that these were only childish fears. At my age, she explained, it was normal to be afraid of statues, puppets, and other denizens of the uncanny valley. It was only a statue. It couldn't hurt me. I did my best to believe her, until the Red Maria started moving around after dark. Some nights, I'd wake to a hard sliding sound, like a ceramic rope scraping across hallway tiles. Whenever I'd work up the courage to peer into the corridor, the Red Maria would be gone. Once, I found it in the bathroom beside the dripping faucet. Another morning, I nearly fell over backwards when it appeared inside my laundry bin. A few weeks before my ninth birthday, I woke up with the undeniable sense that there was a presence in my room. I could feel it, like a hunted animal. I moved slowly my head from side to side, checking my surroundings. There was my disorganized desk, the half-open closet, the lightless television. I gingerly lowered my bare feet onto the tile and felt cold ceramic fingers graze my own. I shrieked loud enough to wake up half the building. My mother burst into the room and bashed on the lights, revealing my two sisters, giggling like mad beneath my bed. The Red Maria stood lifelessly where they'd placed it, right beside my hand. My mother made the three of us carry the Red Maria back to her alcove together. I remember feeling certain that it weighed much more than it should have. The next morning, my younger sister Esmeralda woke up with a fever, and the games with the Red Maria came to a screeching halt. We went to doctor after doctor, but the specialists were at a loss to discover why my younger sister was sleeping so much, or why she'd become so weak. Esmeralda's bedroom took on the sweet rotten odor of a sick room, and my older sister Veronica moved in with me. The more traditional medicine failed to help my younger sister, the more my mother turned to her faith for answers. Suddenly the Red Maria was more important than ever. As the weeks of Esmeralda's illness dragged into months, the alcove at the end of the hall became more like a shrine, overhung with rosaries, perfumed with incense, and cluttered with ruby-colored carnations. I still felt like there was something off about the Red Maria, like it was something more, or less than a humble representation of the Mother of God. But above all else I felt guilty. If only I hadn't been so afraid of that stupid statue, maybe my little sister wouldn't have stayed up late trying to tease me with it. Maybe if she'd gotten more sleep, she never would have gotten sick. I was only nine years old, but I understood cause and effect and I couldn't shake the feeling that somehow it was all my fault. I knew now that there were far more frightening things in the world than a lifeless ceramic statue. Things like inexplicable diseases, hospital debt collectors, or the pink slip that my mother received from her job as a janitor. That September, I took over most of the cooking and cleaning, and Veronica dropped out of school to work illegally in a restaurant. Esmeralda only woke to eat a tiny amount of food, use the restroom, and then return to bed. After months of inconclusive testing, my mother no longer believed that anything but faith could save her daughter. So much happened to the rest of our family that fall that I didn't dare to tell anyone what was happening to me. Faced with my mother's unemployment, Veronica's exhaustion, or Esmeralda's illness, what right did I have to complain about a few nightmares? If they were nightmares, every night, a shadow would pass in front of my bedroom. It hovered for a moment in front of my door, blocking the nightlight's feeble glow then drifted by as soundlessly as smoke. In those moments, I'd clench my sheets until my knuckles went white, praying that Veronica would wake up so I wouldn't have to face the horror alone. But she never did. Instead, I'd hear the groan of Esmeralda's bed springs, like something heavy had just slithered into her mattress. Whatever it was, it was responsible for my sister's illness. I was sure of it, just as I was sure that no adult would ever believe my story about evil statues and moving shadows. Laying in bed, with only a thin wooden door between the shadow and me, I forced myself to wiggle one toe, then another, then my whole foot. Once I had overcome my fear enough to place my feet on the floor and stand up, 
I knew that I could face whatever waited in the hallway. I clutched a flashlight in one hand, a rosary and a child-sized pocket knife in the other. The shadow could move quickly, but so could I. I stuck my head into the hallway just in time to witness a formless black shape squeeze into Esmeralda's room. The realization that the impossible thing I was seeing was actually really washed over me like icy water. Maybe what my mother had said was true. The statue couldn't hurt me, but maybe the thing that dwelt inside of it could. I thought of my little sister's dimpled face giggling under my bed. It had been the last time I'd seen her smile. I sucked a lungful of air down my dry throat and threw open Esmeralda's door. When the beam of my flashlight cut through the inky blackness of my little sister's bedroom, I caught just a glimpse of it, the red Maria from my nightmares, its jaw opened snake-wide as it sucked something smoke-like out of Esmeralda's mouth. The moment the light hit it, it twisted its face into a grotesque expression of hatred and vanished. A shriek pierced the silence. This scream was Esmeralda's, and it felt like it would never stop. Even cradled my mother's arms, my little sister kept screeching until only a wheeze moaned up from her raw lungs. She collapsed back into sleep, pale and exhausted. My mother hit me for the first time that night, so hard that the flashlight flew out of my hand. Didn't I understand the condition my sister was in? How could I even think of risking her health with some absurd nighttime game? When my mother finally stopped shaking me, I was seeing stars. She hugged me, cried, then dragged herself back to bed without a word. As I collected the broken flashlight's batteries and tiptoed out of my sister's room, I would have sworn that the Red Maria's smile was wider and more crimson than usual. I had to find another way. The extra chores I received as punishment for disturbing Esmeralda's rest provided the perfect excuse. I'd just knocked that hateful statue over with a broom. I could say it was an accident, and whatever extra punishment I got for that, well, it would be worth it. The Red Maria, however, didn't break. It didn't even crack, not even when I smashed my aluminum baseball bat onto its delicate features again and again. Instead of shattering ceramic, I heard a whisper of laughter. When I blinked, I saw a horrific vision of what would happen to me that night, when the Red Maria enjoyed its sweet, slow revenge. I walked back downstairs into the living room. I felt hollow, unsure what to do with myself. I'd never seen death up close, or even thought about it, and certainly nothing so visceral as the gory images that had just flashed through my mind. I didn't want to die, I didn't want to close my eyes and wake up somewhere as dark and empty as the inside of a ceramic statue, yet if I didn't somehow free my family from the Red Maria before the nightfall, I had no doubt that I'd be dead before dawn. I could already imagine it, nine-year-old me, huddled in the television's blue glow with my flickering flashlight, watching a blacker-than-black figure trickle into the room. Whatever it did to me would look like an accident, I was sure of it, and the thing inside the Red Maria would continue to drain Esmeralda. I had to act fast. Veronica would be home from work in a few hours, and my mother could return from her job search at any time. I bundled the Red Maria into a heavy trash bag. Its angry whispers resounded in my ears. At any moment I expected tendrils of shadow to creep out from the thin plastic and slither down my throat. I did my best to keep the covered statue beneath bright light while I rummaged in my closet. Beneath mothballed stuffed animals and cardboard boxes of football memorabilia, I finally found what I was looking for, the red wagon that Veronica had pulled me around in when I was a toddler. Armed with a hand-drawn free sign, I wheeled the Red Maria to the trashiest street corner I knew of. Anything from a bedbug-ridden mattress to an armless office chair would disappear if left there overnight, and I had a sneaking suspicion that it was where my mother did a lot of our holiday shopping. The broken lamp and abandoned Barbie cheap already waiting on the corner cast long, eerie shadows in the late afternoon sun. I unbagged the Red Maria, bound the sign around its neck, and hoped for the best. Walking home, I couldn't help but feel sure that the Red Maria would be waiting for me, a smile on its crimson lips. Instead, I found that my mother and both of my sisters were gone. My mother's heels were by the door, Veronica's work hat and keys lay on the table, and Esmeralda's sick was empty. Panic rose in my chest. Had the Red Maria taken my family? The front door creaked open. My mother rushed into the house and hugged me close. Behind her, Esmeralda was swinging from Veronica's arm, asking if she could go back to school and see her friends yet. My little sister's mysterious illness had vanished as suddenly and strangely as it had appeared. Everyone thought it was a miracle, everyone but me. I was just as thrilled as my mother and sister about Esmeralda's recovery until I thought more deeply about what might mean. The Red Maria was with another family now. Someone had picked it up from that junky corner, someone in search of a decoration, a symbol of faith, or a cheap gift. 
my little sister was safe because the Red Maria had found another victim. Garbage juice. My dad had to pull a lot of strings to get me a spot in the sanitation trainee program. He put it all on the line for me, but even though I passed the course, I eventually showed him that I didn't have what it took. He devoted his life to sanitation work. He didn't expect the same of me. He just expected me to honor the job when I asked him to hook me up. His expectations weren't met. Those days, I was drinking around the clock and betting my salary on horses. I lost a lot on California Chrome in 2016, more than I had in the bank. I asked my dad for help, and he left. Maybe because I was drinking, I thought about buying a gun to get the bookie, Travis, off my back. It was more than a passing thought. I met with these two gangsters, Kunlin and Scott, who offered to sell me one. A browning high power, untraceable. They said they scooped it up from the river while going magnet fishing. We were making small talk while we waited for the gun. One of their guys was grabbing it from the stash house offsite. That's how they found out I was a sanitation worker. They perked up. Sanitation. Like garbage. Just like garbage. I thought Kunlin and Scott were going to ask me to help them get rid of a body. I'd already thought about how I could feed Travis to the truck, so I guess that's why my mind went there. But that's not what they were interested in. They wanted the leachate. Leachate. Like garbage juice. I asked. Yeah, garbage juice, Kunlin said. I really wish that's as weird as it got. I said, what the fuck do you want garbage juice for? The fuck is it to you if I'm offering to pay? Said Scott. We talked numbers, and they brought out a bottle of E&J. We got drunk, and they told me they'd pay 50 bucks a liter. A garbage truck can fill a 200 liter tank in one day, so that would be $10,000 per drop. If I could find a way to get the juice out of the truck and into the gangster's hands. Finally, their guy called from the stash house and said that the browning had already been sold. By that point, I'd taken a Xanax bar and had drunk quite a bit of E&J, so I was pretty out of it. I got out of there and figured I'd dreamt the whole conversation about the garbage juice. But Kunlin and Scott kept badgering me. They really wanted that juice. Texting me and texting me. They'd say things like, hey, you still got that juice plug. We'll pay dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. These guys, man. I was desperate, though. And Travis was still all over me, taking my whole paycheck. So I said, fuck it. They want juice, I'll give them juice. I started plotting away. I got the hookup on a truck with a vacuum tank for cleaning porta potties. There was the first guy I'd have to cut into the deal. I'd have to work fast during my shift to leave time to transfer the juice from the garbage truck to the porta potty truck without holding up my road. And then there was the other sanitation worker on my road, Moses, who I'd have to kiss into the deal just for staying quiet. Everyone wanted to know what I was scheming. Not that I had a good answer. While I was plotting, I was still drinking of course, because a drinking problem doesn't just disappear. I crossed paths with my dad in the locker room, and he could smell it on me. I can't prove it, but I think he snitched on me to the manager. I was fired for drinking on the job, and I was drunk when they fired me. My fucking dad, man. Now I was an unemployed, gambling addicted alcoholic with a debt to a bookie who wasn't going to be happy to find out my monthly installments had vanished. Thankfully, I'd put the wheels in motion on the juice plug before I was fired. All I had to do was sweeten the deal a bit more for Moses, the guy on my old route. I'd drive the tanker. I'd vacuum the juice. All Moses had to do was be at the meetup spot at the right time and place. Next thing I knew, I had ten grand in cold, hard tender, untaxable. Those gangsters paid up. I was as astonished as you probably are reading this. I made a lot of money selling leachate. Everyone thought I was crazy, of course, but no one cared when they got their cut. I started regretting that I dished out such sweet deals all around. I was pocketing a third of the cash after Moses told another sanitation guy what was going on and demanded to be cut in. I paid off Travis, but I was still feeling greedy. At one drop, Kunlin and Scott brought along this hippie named Joseph. The gangsters said Joseph, who was apparently their juice buyer, thought I was diluting the juice. It wasn't having the same effect. Effect? What effect? That was none of my business, apparently. The two gangsters threatened to cut my head off. Joseph the hippie said, Hey, hey, calm down, calm down. I swore I wasn't diluting the garbage juice, because why the fuck would I dilute garbage juice? I just suctioned it up and dropped it off. Kinlin and Scott called me a liar. When Joseph tried to chill them out again, the gangsters told him that he didn't understand how guys like me operate. After some back and forth, me swearing I wasn't diluting the juice, Kunlin and Scott calling me a liar and threatening me, and Joseph trying to chill the whole situation out, the gangsters finally came off it. 
Joseph guessed it was some inconsistency in the quality of juice. Maybe extra precipitation had diluted it. We went our separate ways, status quo, but I had a new idea. I still had no idea what anyone wanted juice for, but I did now know that I was selling juice to the gangsters and the gangsters were selling it to the hippie, so I thought I'd cut out the middleman. I paid Moses to tail the gangsters after the drop, see where the juice went. Moses reported back that they brought the tanker into this fenced-off warehouse out in Jurupa Valley. Moses gave me the address and I stacked it out. I eventually saw Joseph the hippie leave in a shitty pickup and tailed him to his home in Ukapa. When I flagged down Joseph in his front yard, he pulled a gun on me, told me to get off his property or he'd shoot. I told him to be easy. I backed away. I finally got my question out. I asked how much he was paying those gangsters for the juice. What's it to you? Said Joseph. Just trying to see if I can get you a better deal, I said. Turns out Kinlin and Scott were flipping the juice for 60 GS. You wanna save 20,000 a drop? I said. Wouldn't make any difference to me to just drive the juice straight to the warehouse. Win-win. Joseph was hesitant. He didn't know me. Didn't know if he could trust me, he said. But he came around over our little chat on his front lawn. Apparently he liked money as much as I did. I told Kinlin and Scott what I told Joseph I'd tell them. That I'd gotten caught and the jig was up. While Kinlin and Scott went around trying to find another sanitation guy, I was delivering the juice straight to the nerve center. Business was good after that. Really good. But I wasn't saving much. I just had more to play with. Bookies will let things slide at bigger numbers. Travis now let me bet over what I had on hand by a factor of three. So I dug myself another hole. Eight rings ran in to storm the court. That fucked me. I got the idea that I'd cut out the middleman again. Repeat my business plan. See what the hippie was doing with the juice once and for all and suss out the next opportunity down the supply chain. In the past, what I did was drive onto the lot in Jurupa Valley in my porta potty vacuum tanker, which I owned outright at this point. Hook the hose up to this giant tank that was partially buried in the ground and drain the juice. Then I'd get my money and leave. One night after a drop, I snuck in. The lot was rigged with some pretty high-tech security, but it wasn't too hard to breach. I guess it was deep enough in the boonies that they weren't too worried about trespassers. I watched Joseph smoking a cigarette outside of the warehouse in full hazmat-like coveralls. When he went back inside, I grabbed the door and slid inside. Inside the warehouse, the first thing I noticed were the hoses running through the place. They crawled up the walls and hung from the ceiling, fastened in a maze of spirals. The warehouse was huge. It could probably hold a plane, but the only actual structure inside there was a circular fence of plastic sheeting. I gathered quickly enough that the maze of hoses was pumping the juice, carrying it to the center of the warehouse, right above the fenced-off circle of plastic sheeting, and raining juice down on whatever was inside. The leachate came down in a steady, unending drizzle. Hovering around the plastic fencing were other people in hazmat coveralls. I couldn't tell which one was Joseph any longer. I couldn't tell what any of them were doing. But they looked busy, carrying clipboards and writing things down. You couldn't fathom the smell inside that place. The literal scent of hundreds upon thousands of liters of garbage juice raining from the ceiling, spiraling down drains built into the warehouse floor. I saw why they wore coveralls. My approach into the warehouse made it difficult for me to maneuver much further. I'd found a nice hiding spot behind what I assumed was another tank of leachate. I realized I was lucky I didn't get spotted immediately when I entered because the hazmats came and went constantly. I thought I'd wait it out until their shift was up and then sneak back out, until I discovered there was a night shift tagging them out. At that point, I thought I was truly fucked. Where was I going to go? Then, there was a commotion of activity. Something was happening on the inside of the plastic sheeting. Some chaos. The hazmats shouted. I couldn't make out what they were saying. Even though I couldn't see inside the circle of plastic sheeting, I could tell there was something inside something moving. I heard one of the hazmats shout, watch out. A person was then thrown from inside the sheeting. The guy went shooting across the room like he was hit with the force of a moving bus. The guy hit the wall and collapsed. His fellow hazmats came to his side and removed his mask. The guy's face was a bloody pulp from the impact. An alarm was switched. They dragged him out. One of the hazmats still near the plastic sheeting was shouting into it. Bad boy, bad, bad boy, scolding whatever was in there. This was my window, my chance. As the hazmats dragged the injured, maybe dead man toward the door I'd entered through, I could only go one direction, deeper into the warehouse. I hugged the wall and moved quickly. There was too much chaos to notice me. Thankfully, I found a door and took it. I was now inside some type of break room. 
It was empty. There were lunch tables, a box TV, and a whiteboard. Math equations were drawn across the whiteboard in erasable markers. I saw an unused set of coveralls. The key to my escape. I quickly put them on, zipped myself up, and then re-entered the warehouse proper. No one questioned me now. The chaos had subsided a bit. I looked towards the exit, and then back towards the fence of plastic sheeting. I had to know, so I approached. I arrived before the plastic fencing and peeled it back to see what was in there. At first, I couldn't tell what I was looking at. A giant lump, about the size of a garbage truck, getting rained down on by garbage juice. The thing had rough, gray skin with bristling clumps of hair. Then, I noticed the thing had what looked like flippers. And then, sure enough, I realized the thing was alive when a basketball-sized eye fluttered open and looked right at me. The thing flapped its flipper, tossing pooling leachate onto its back. An enormous tongue emerged from what I didn't even realize was a mouth until it cracked open. The tongue slapped its own back, licking up the juice, and then the tongue reached out towards me and touched my coveralls, almost tenderly. When I found the ability to move my legs, I backed out of there and made straight for the exit. I shedded the coveralls on my way to the lot's security fence. I exited, took the alley down to my truck, and drove away. I tried to return to life as usual after that. Life as usual being drinking and siphoning off garbage juice and selling the juice to the hippie. Every time I drove onto the lot, I had a sick feeling having seen a glimpse of what was inside that warehouse. I needed a new gig. I didn't know what I saw, but I knew there was no more middlemen to cut out of whatever the fuck was happening there. But I didn't have much time to think about it. Travis was all over me, and there was no chance I'd ever have the money to pay up in full. Instead of doing his own dirty work, Travis got even with me by tipping off Gunlin and Scott telling them that I was still in the business of garbage juice. I found out the hard way when they staked me out in front of Joseph's warehouse. I was taking the usual route, a few blocks out from the drop, when my tires burst. I'd driven over some caltrops laid in the asphalt. I don't know how I got away. Call it fight or flight. The gangsters came down on me ready to do good by their threat of cutting my head off. But I escaped. I threw punches and ran and dodged the ensuing gunfire. My porta potty tanker took several caps to the side and began leaking garbage juice all over the street. Felt like my days were numbered after that one. I laid low at Moses' place until he heard I had a mark on my head and kicked me out. I had one move left. I drove out to Ukapa and staked out the hippie's house again. When I intercepted him in the front yard, Joseph said, What happened to you? He fell off. It's complicated, I said. Look, I said, I don't like doing this, but I need money. Money, said Joseph. The fuck you talking about? Money. No juice, no pay. Just as Joseph was about to enter his home, I said, I know about the thing. He looked at me funny. What thing? He said. In the warehouse, I said. He looked me up and down. He knew exactly what I was talking about. Of course. You're bribing me. He finally said. I nodded my head, a bit embarrassed. I don't need much, I told him. Just enough to get out of town. And then you'll never hear from me again. I won't say a word. Joseph sized me up. I bet he wished he had his pistol on him. He finally said, what are we talking about? 50 GS, I said. 50 GS, said Joseph. Come on, I said. I know you're good for it. Of course he was good for it. Whatever was going on in that warehouse, it was an operation with deep pockets. That much I'd learned in my time delivering leachate. He sized me up one more time. And then you'll go, he said. Poof, I said. I guess he could read me, because he knew I was telling the truth. And I was. Joseph gave me the cash and said, I never want to see you again. We never did see each other again, and I stayed true to my promise up until this point of putting pen to paper. But before I dipped with my 50,000, I did ask him one more question. What was that thing? I asked. You wouldn't understand, he said. I'm not going to say where I live now for obvious reasons, but it's a long ways from Riverside, far away from that warehouse and whatever the fuck it was housing. But I can tell you this, whenever I pass a pungent dumpster, all I can think of is a four foot tongue licking up leachate. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed these stories then hit the like. See you guys next time.